so we've got a couple of minutes. Um, we can either get started early or we can wait two minutes. It's up to, well, it's up I, to I, I could burn a minute or two just saying who I am because everyone comes here to know who the speaker is as opposed to the content, right? Who are you? Yes. I, I can actually say something amazing about Caskey that I don't know about anyone else. Oh. But I don't believe anyone else. Sorry, that I don't think I know about anyone else. He's the only person I've heard legitimately use the term nano kills per second. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. That is true. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a lightning talk I give about uh, the world's first full stack samurai, and uh, he achieved a lifetime rate of, I believe it was 0.163 nano kills per second uh, during his career fighting. So that's a fun talk. Um, so we're pretty much ready to start, so I'll just hand it over. Uh, this is uh, Multiplayer Game and Distributed Status, the exact title there, I didn't want to read the wrong. By Kasky, he is an SRE at Microsoft Azure, uh, is that correct? Yep, I still there. Um, I'm just going to let him take on it, and then after this is lunch, so. Yeah, I have the great uh, uh, power of being able to prevent any of you from eating, so I can go on as long as I want, and you guys don't get to eat. Uh, that also means you're the most distracted audience of the day, so I don't need to actually provide my A game. So I'm going to talk about distributed state. Um, my background is in systems and communications and uh, site reliability, uh, basically running online services. And so my view of a game is limited to state management and data transfer and all that stuff. And so I don't really, I'm not a UX guy, I'm not a gameplay designer. I love games, I'm a gamer, but I could never create, I couldn't create a game to save my life. But this is my view and what I can contribute to uh, people's understanding of game design, because um, hopefully it'll be helpful. So ultimately, most games, especially a multiplayer game, is an exercise, a multiplayer uh, online game, is an exercise in distributed state management. In order for people to play a game together, they both need to be able to see the context of the game in the same way so they can react to what's evolving. Now, and the easiest way of having distributed state is you just get rid of the distributed process. You basically have a, a board game, a board where everybody looks at the state of the game. It fully is represented there. There's no ambiguity about what the state of the game is. There's no uh, uh, lag death in a chess board where two people are sitting across from each other, right? Um, and that manifests itself in video games in uh, single, single player, single device play. Who recognizes this game? Heroes of Might and Magic 2, yeah. And of course, for, for the more console-oriented, everyone, I'm sure, recognizes this one, right? Yeah. Um, that's GoldenEye. Uh, but the, the whole point in, in these two examples, here, three examples, Heroes of Might and Magic, GoldenEye, and uh, uh, Chess, is there's no distributed state. There's one device that has the entire state of the game, and everyone sees the exact same information. Um, when, as soon as you start spl splitting that state between two locations, you begin to have a problem. Um, the classic example in Chess uh, which has been done for literally thousands of years, is what's called correspondence chess. Each player maintains their own chess board, and you have to find some way of synchronizing changes. Now, chess is a beautiful example because there's only about 30, well, there's actually about 24 bytes of state that will represent every possible state space of a chess board. And all you need to worry about is, is my state accurate, and is the transition I'm about to apply a valid one? I'm not going to get into move validation uh, too much because I only have 20 minutes and... There's only 15 left. OK. Um, <laughs> so correspondence chess is basically a delta-based system where you basically send less than two bytes. It's about 10 bits of data that say, OK, this is the state change from, um, from then till now. Uh, and it's a game that's latency insensitive. The frame rate of the game is the frame rate of players choosing to make a move. Now, this is very different from uh, more traditional, what we would consider a traditional video game, where the game continues to play even if the player is not touching the controller, especially if you have an opponent that's continuing to, to shoot you. So, uh, the problem with delta-based uh, game state, delta-based game state allows you to have very, very tiny uh, state updates, about uh, uh, less than two bytes, it's about 12 bits, um, that allow you to update a 32-byte game state board. But if a cat knocks over your, your, your game board, you have, to either have, you have to either replay the entire game to get back to the position or ask your uh, opponent to say, hey, send me a picture of the uh, game board. Now, um, why don't you just send photos of your game board back and forth. Now that'd be an example of game state management where every single move, the entire game state is transferred back and forth, because you could do that. I make a move, take a picture of my game board, send you the picture, and then you look at the picture and decide, hey, all right, oh, there's his move, because you just look at the difference between your game board and, and the other person. Now if the cat knocks over your board, you can say, well, I'll assume that his move was legal, and I'll just reset up my board uh, his way. So um, resynchronization of state is important in games where there isn't a known start state. Now in chess, and in any level-based game, um, 
everyone starts from the same place. But if you have real-time open worlds, then a big problem is if there's 400 players that are on actively engaging and interacting with the world and you join, you need to suddenly synchronize all of that state down before you can even begin playing. All right? And we, I'm not going to get into the, the complexity of, of syncing down state and then doing rewind or replay to catch up because that is not going to fit in the uh, 14 minutes I have left. So instead we'll talk about um, just what we, the, the, the basic recap of, of state management in chess. Um, uh, we have local copies of the game state. Um, we are passing back and forth just small deltas and they're very easy to, uh, to transfer back and forth, especially if you have an expensive communication medium. Um, and resynchronization, there's a couple different options to, to handle that. Um, and of course, latency is not a factor um, because essentially the frame rate is whatever you want it to be. You're not, there's no free running game engine. Um, but what if latency were a factor? And it's, it, this is interesting because I did a res some research to try and find, are there any chess, there are lots of online chess games and chess implementations, but very few of them do fast chess. I was, I had a hard time finding a quality app that implemented speed chess. And that's because the latency factor is, extre is extremely important in speed chess. For those who aren't familiar with speed chess, who, who I mean, is this a room full of people who play speed chess? No, good, okay. Um, so basically, each t you take turns taking a turn, but there's five minutes per player allocated at the beginning. And as soon as your turn begins, your time starts going away. And when you make your move, you hit a button and now the other person's time is being deducted. So the total game takes at most 10 minutes Except each time it's be your turn begins, 10 seconds gets added to your, your, your clock. So if you make every single move in less than 10 seconds, you'd end the game with five minutes to spare. And if you ever run out of time, you lose. So you can, for some moves, you can ponder for 20, 30, 40 seconds, and you only, it'll cost you 15 or 25 seconds, right? But that latency aspect, it, it, it amazed me that nobody has tried to make a quality speed chess app. And it occurs to me that that's because the latency can drastically change the game. If you've got 3,000 millisecond, 3, milliseconds of latency for a particular move, that's 13 seconds versus 10 seconds. That can be a huge advantage to a chess player. Um, so what do, what do we do when we have larger state spaces? Um, this is a uh, uh, screenshot from a game everybody here should know, Dota 2. Um, but there's a lot going on. We're way beyond 32 bits to completely represent the state of a Dota map during the middle of the game play. You've got, you've got ongoing uh, effects, you have, you have player positions, you have the, the environmental changes going on and so on. Um, there's a lot that's happening, but in the end, if you're doing delta-based uh, transmission of changes, because of the map starts synchronized at a particular place, all the players have to be in the game before the game begins, and you're not allowed to join afterward, it's really no different than chess, just ramped up. More states, more moves, more possible changes. Instead of being able to update the game in two bytes, you have to update it in much larger packets, but it's still the exact same concept. That's very different from an open world environment like the, the open areas of WoW and any other game that has an environment where you can join and rejoin. Okay, because there you have to sync down the total state of the world and then catch up. Now, the beauty of the beauty that was wow is they used gameplay mechanics to hide tremendous amounts of things. I mean, the cooldown play effect. They weren't the ones who invented the concept of cooldown, but the way it hides latency, allowing them to deal with the fact that if, uh, if an attack has a five second cooldown and there's an extremely low latency going to a, another player, so let's say it takes three seconds to get there, they can backdate the start of that effect to when the actual effect was started, and then, oh, there's only two seconds left on the other player's cooldown. So it allows them to backdate the start of attacks because of the cooldown. It's a beautiful mechanic that hides the latency by making it part of the gameplay, but players think of it as going forward latency, but in reality, it's, it's a trick to mask the fact that they can't deliver data until much later than it needs to be consumed. Um, so yeah, so uh, however, for much of the very exciting aspects of gameplay, instances, uh, uh, dungeons and so on, they revert right back to the same level design where they get a bunch of players, everybody has to be there at the beginning, and that allows uh, the appearance of very, very real-time combat and, and, and interaction um, by limiting the number of players, limiting the number of state transitions, having a fixed world that starts at a particular state and only goes through a certain amount of changes before it ends and it's all cleaned up. And so, in general, basically, if you, have a small, if you have a fixed starting state and you only use deltas, you can create a lot of fun. And this is used tremendously in a lot of apps that are marketed as open world gameplay, but in reality, you're just playing a whole bunch of little tiny games and it's hidden behind this veneer of, of, a, of, a, of a, a narrative that makes it why you have to have that kind of model. Um, dynamic shared state. Uh, when you're dealing with dynamic shared state, which all of those games during the gameplay are this dynamic model where there's all sorts of things changing, you have to deal with the fundamental consistency throughput trade-off. Now, you can, 
if you wanted, you could try and give everybody, you know, every 10 milliseconds, update everybody as the state of everybody else. But if you chose to do that, there'd be very, very little amount of data you could share. Now, if you were playing chess, you could have 10 millisecond moves because you only got to transfer two bytes every uh, 10 milliseconds. But if you have a large world state where there's many players, all of whom are moving in different directions, and you have different position updates, you have different poses that you have to synchronize, you have to limit how frequently you transfer game state. You might be limited to 150 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, maybe even 1,000 milliseconds before you've transmitted a full set of state change information. Um, and the nice thing is, though, that the more information you share, the greater the fidelity. Now, how many times has someone played on a, a, a first-person shooter and you've been, you move behind a wall and all of a sudden you die, but you're under complete cover from the person who attacked you, right? Yeah, everyone's had this. And like, oh my God, you're, you know, uh, you're, you're sniping through walls. That's totally unfair. In reality, though, the person who shot you, they're see they were seeing your position you know, 500 milliseconds delayed. And so you may have been moving behind cover, but, th and they, but when they shot you, you were not behind cover according to their perception of the world at that time. And back in the, in the 2000s, we used to talk about games with good net code and bad net code and whatnot. And ultimately, it came down to how they hid that information. I'll talk about one of those strategies in a little bit. So minimizing state transfer, there's a lot of tricks that we can play to, to, to try and make it so that the, the problems of state transfer aren't immediately apparent to the user, all right? Um, minimizing the state that you actually have to transfer is a big one. Do you need to provide what we call full body channel information? The entire articulated uh, position of the person's avatar, including the exact angle of every single finger at every single moment? No. Not necessarily. Really, you can get away with what, what you call a rigid body channel, which basically says, you know, uh, uh, position in 3D state plus the uh, yaw pitch and roll of that and you can just provide a default view of that avatar and that would be enough information fits in less than 32 bytes and you could update that very 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 frequently now that's not very good fidelity when you're up close if you're doing a real-time 3D fighting game you might want to provide more information but this is where tricks like having pre-scripted animations come into play all you got to do is say are you playing animation one two three four five as opposed to actually having to send fully articulated information okay the arms here now it's there now it's here and so on and so forth. So these are tricks that you can use where you've pre-baked in the fixed set of states that someone can do. Now, um, in, open, in open world games, uh, you could do things like, I'm gonna record a set of state transfers, upload them to someone else, and so I can play my own customized animations, but that's actually hiding the fact that you're not actually sending a live animation, you're simply saying, oh, replay that animation I've already downloaded to you. And pre-sharing information is a great way to gather a lot of state and get it somewhere else. The base level design of just, of any map, that's pre-shared state. You'll get hundreds of uh, megabytes or gigabytes of level information. That's information that doesn't need to be downloaded to every player every single time. All you need to do is get the setup information. All right, uh, partitioning and zoning, uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, so frequent state regeneration. Um, this is basically where you want to try and update information as quickly as possible, but not all data is needed every time. If, for instance, you have late position information for another player, so you're getting updates, you know, you, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. If there's lag, there's no reason to apply the two previous, I was here and I was there, just simply skip ahead to where uh, uh, someone is right now. Frequent state regeneration means that even if you miss some data, as long as you're getting enough in that delta feed that you can figure out where things should be, you could miss out on portions of the information along the way. This is used in uh, MPEG video streams. You'll get some garbled video for a while, but once you get a base frame, which is, here's the, because MPEG encoding is mostly a delta-based encoding saying, here's what changed from one frame to the next to the next. Every so often you get a complete, un uncompressed, but it's still compressed, but a complete image that in one shot shows you the entire screen, and then they begin applying deltas to it. But if there's data loss, then you need a complete base frame before you can begin applying delta frames to that. Same thing can be done with, with data streams about information about players and games. All right, five minutes. Um, so you can also hide that using gameplay mechanics. Uh, on the right here, I've got a couple of contrived examples. Blue is moving from their bottom position to the top position. In a first-person shooter, blue might, in a single, in a single uh, 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 update, move behind cover, and yet all of a sudden red managed to kill them even though they were behind cover because red shot them based upon the position they thought they were at at the starting, right? Now, in an open world game like Dota, where you use targeting, and the mechanics isn't exactly where you are in the world with uh, uh, world environment instead, it's if you're within targetable range, then uh, someone can designate you as the, the victim of an attack. This plays on the fact that humans are really, really bad at comparing angular distances to things. And so you might, you don't know on a pixel perfect basis if you technically were or were not within the attack range. So, they don't need to care. You just assume that the game's correct and it hides these details because also the distance you can move in say 300 milliseconds of the game 
is not that perceptible compared to the maximum range of the attack. So they say you're designated attack, you get the attack, the next attack though you're out of range. Um, the other thing that's great, similar to the first person shooter, um, is you simply prevent them from moving fast enough to ever be able to duck behind cover, they wouldn't think that they do it. The best game that I love that takes complete advantage of this technique, World of Tanks. You're driving this ginormous tank, yet your, your POV is right in the center of this really long thing. You're like, oh, I'm going behind this you know, little building here. It's like, ah, oh, I got shot in the butt. That's just because the person attacking you might have shot you straight dead center, but by the time it hit you, only your butt was sticking up, but you accept that as, oh, okay, I got a really big butt you know, 10 feet behind me, so it's okay. And it's complete fabrication. So making the players move so slow that the frame rate update hides the fact that, that they actually would have been behind cover if they truly had correct synchronized information. So you can use your gameplay and your story, your, that's using your story and your setting to hide a very, very difficult technical problem of real-time synchronized state. So, I love that example. Um, if you do accept that you want high fidelity, real-time uh, views of information, um, you can do things like dead reckoning. So, here's an example of a game, um, pardon my notation, but uh, blue is the current player, that's you, and you have the view of where you are at time zero because you're you. You always have completely up-to-date information about you. However, your information about red is one network, up, network update behind. So you're targeting red, and you're targeting where they were one frame ago. Now, you're, this is the classic example. They're going to duck behind a wall. We don't know where red is right now for real. We just know where they were last time they were updated. And so um, if we wanted to render them today, or right now, as to where we think they should be, the game can, instead of rendering them at negative one, it'll say, look, at negative two, they were there. At negative one, they're here. We're going to assume that they're going to be over here, and we'll render them on screen at the position we assume they were going to be at if they continued doing what they were going to do. And that provides effects that make it much more real. If there was a wall there, blue would not even choose to shoot them, even though in reality, according to the information they had, the person wasn't behind the wall. And so you don't create those scenarios where someone gets shot when they're behind a wall because the game was rendering them as unshootable, even though they may actually have been shootable. However, let's say that we predicted that, but when we suddenly get a new update, again, time zero is now, uh, time minus two is where we were, we get this update and it turns out that no, red took off to the right. And we're now aiming at a predicted rendering spot that's way f away from where they were. It could be they're running down a hallway that we had clear visibility. We could have shot them in the back, you know, two frames ago, right? So how do we correct this? Because once you begin predicting game state, the question that you, didn't have the, you then have the problem, how do you correct incorrect predictions? Because if we were to render right now, and we, we should be rendering them somewhere over there, but we're going to render them there. So there are a couple solutions. The least satisfactory to a user is this one, where you immediately snap them to the new position, warping. Okay? That creates the most dissatisfaction from users. Like, what? I, I was shooting them, and all of a sudden he appears over there. What's the first reaction? Hacks. Right? Yeah. Exactly. But the reality is 90% of what appears to be hacks is just network code that is taking cheap and easy outs for solving problems while also trying to use things like dead reckoning to predict behavior. Now, a much better solution is you interpolate to their new predicted position and you use intervening frames. Because remember, your local game frame rate is not the same as your network update frame rate, and it may or may not be the same as your rendering frame rate. So you use your local game state update frame rate. You instead say, okay, I need to have a more complex prediction than straight line, and I need to catch up to my new prediction. Because notice we're interpolating not to where they were, but to where we now think they're going to be, but we now interpolate to that new location. And so this is a way of hiding that, and so someone will do something weird. They might move slightly faster than, than the game mechanics would normally allow because you've got to, you know, uh, 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 catch up, yeah. Um, but you do that, and that creates a much more satisfying user experience because you, have, you create this illusion of a set of rules, and, you ex and players expect games to be consistent within the rules that you present them. And when the game is inconsistent with its own rule set, users get very, very unhappy. So... Uh, another way of dealing with uh, managing distributed state when you have too much information, no one server, no one backend can handle the simultaneous number of users are classic uh, 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 solutions like uh, partitioning them, you use realms where you, you basically have completely separate game spaces where these players have no, have no intersection with the world of these players over there and they can only interact with each other within that concept. Uh, concept. Uh, use things like lobbies and game matching where you go back to you know, session-based games where there's a, a, a single uh, encounter with a fixed group of people, everyone gets the game state, and then everyone can play with anyone else, but everybody can't play with everybody else at the same time. Um, dungeon instances. Uh, dynamic handoff. This is something that's less common, where you have what are called area managers, where you do have a, a dynamic open world, but 
as people transition from one area to the next area, they're actually changing which server they're connecting to and resynchronizing state. WoW made heavy use of this because you had those weird, you know, the city entrances and exits. Um, the uh, a great example of them handing really complex transitions was the flight model back when it was uh, on Rails. Basically, they're just showing you a fun animation while they're sitting in the background rapidly unloading the entire realm you were all those graphic assets and loading back in all of the context for the, the far distance that you were going to move, right? So lots of tricks for dealing with that that can be incorporated into the, to, into the lore and into the, the theme. Um, human factors, we've talked a lot about this. Um, all right, minute and a half left. Um, uh, Cooldowns on actions, we talked about that. Um, I mean, hum ultimately, human factors are the best thing because you want humans to fool themselves. It's far easier to get someone to believe a lie they've told themselves than for you to try and get them to believe a lie. So when you're designing your games, when you're designing your gameplay mechanics, think of and you run into technical problems, think of ways you can modify your game so that the human will tell themselves a lie that covers the technical problem that's underlying the situation. It, it, it's a beautiful solution. So, and do not use this knowledge for evil. Don't go start a religion, don't, <laughs> right? Because getting people to believe lies they've told themselves can be a very, very powerful tool. Um, uh, another game that's been played for millennia. Um, <laughs> Uh, level design, uh, game thematics, you know, the fact that Dota doesn't have a cover mechanism, um, and it's always played in the forest, it's outdoors, you know, that the, the theme reinforces the notion that there's no such thing as being able to hide inside of a building, you know, and so they don't need to have that kind of stuff. Um, kill shot replay. Even if you have really bad net code and, you know, someone gets shot behind a wall, before the player has the time to think, wait, I was behind the wall, you immediately replay an animation but when the animation's replayed, it's not you standing behind the wall, it's you standing in front of the window. And your mind immediately says, oh, I was in the window, I got shot. But the reality is they're playing the rewound version of the game at the time you got killed, not where you actually were. Again, you immediately get the player to see a scene which they convince themselves was the reality that happened, they tell themselves the lie, and they're happy with your game. They're not feeling disgruntled of the fact that they're being shot off screen. So anyway, uh, that's it. Is there a good uh, recommendation for something to read this, read about this stuff when I actually don't have time to learn it properly? <laughs> well, game engines hide a lot of this stuff for you. If, uh, I mean, we've come a long way from, from where we were when I started researching game design and distributed systems, um, where you had to build all the stuff your code. Modern game engines create multiplayer artifacts that, that, that or multiplayer mechanics that you can take advantage of. Um, but the, the key thing to remember is that the, the laws of physics still apply. You can't actually appear to be in the same place on two different computers at the same time. And make sure that your story doesn't believe the lies that your, your engine tells you about what's possible. Because um, otherwise you end up with gameplay that, be, that dissatisfies the user. Yeah, cloning an existing game using the same uh, framework that they use to build it ensures that a lot of those problems have been solved. Um, all right, so I think that's it. We'll just give Casting another round of applause and then out to lunch. <laughs>